Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Catherine. Welcome, Catherine. I am so excited to talk to you today. So how are you doing? Thanks so much for having me. All is good here. Yes. So for everybody listening, we're going to talk about forgiveness. Um, I usually don't do a big, huge, long introduction, but I wanted to say that she is a three-time award-winning author, bestseller of 12 books. So the forgiveness book, the ultimate path to forgiveness, unlocking your power. Yep. You have to be willing to forgive someone to read your book. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, you don't believe okay. it or not. No, you don't. Everybody says you have to forgive. Nobody teaches you how. And as we said before we hit record, everybody listening to this broadcast right now, if you're, if you rate everybody in your life on a 10 scale with 10 being the worst, hardest thing, you're all thinking of that number 10 person that is unforgivable and you don't want to forgive them. So you're thinking of, you know, clicking the stop button. Please don't because <laughs> I'm the only one in the world that's going to tell you, you don't have to forgive that person if you don't want to, because there's so many other things you can forgive before you even get to that Yetzi person. Interesting. Mm -hmm. What got you to this topic? What, what got you to even go there about forgiveness? I was an angry teenager, the typical slouched, dressed all in black. I'm from New York. We always dress in black, but I really <laughs> dressed in black because I was depressed. And in the eighth grade, my parents got a horrible divorce. I was getting really bullied badly in, in school. And because of all this, I tried to commit suicide. Didn't, still mm -hmm. here. But I spent the next at least 10 to 15 years angry. And then my anger turned into my story. And my story became who I was. I was a survivor of a dysfunctional family. I survived all these horrible things. And if I gave out my story, who would I be? So I kept my story. I even tried to spin it funny occasionally. People would laugh, and I'm, but I was still telling it. So my mother died in 1990. Yeah, I'm, I am very old. No, <laughs> and I'm sorry and, about your mom. Oh, thank you. But she died and I realized that if I didn't lose my anger and change, I probably was going to die too, somehow, young. So I changed and I read some articles about forgiveness and I thought, well, nobody teaches you how to forgive. Nobody. They just say, you need to forgive. Okay. How do I do that? Nobody tells you. So I thought, well, I'll just start forgiving people. And that's what started my journey because in those days, I had one friend. I never left my apartment. I was mourning my mother and it was awful. But as I started to forgive people, I started, the light started to dawn. I started to venture out of my apartment, but I didn't figure out exactly how to forgive people until about 20 years later. Is there a wrong way? There is no wrong way to forgive people, but the, the trouble with forgiveness today is I, I get a lot of people who say, well, Catherine, you know, I did forgive them. Yeah, you did. But you're still thinking about them. You go on Facebook or social media and you see their name and you just wish bad things on this person. Come on. Everybody does it. Don't right. lie. We right. all look at those childhood bullies and then we see something bad happens to them and we don't go, oh, that's too bad. We go, mm, yeah, karma. <laughs> I think that's the whole reason. Right? Facebook is even a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People want to go on there and see if so-and-so got fat or ugly. <laughs> exactly. And if they were your childhood bullies, you didn't like that person in right. your head, you're going, well, they probably deserved it at some level. <laughs> but you know, nobody tells you about how to forgive. So because people are missing a step that I discovered, they're not staying forgiven. So okay. here's the secret sauce to forgiveness. I do have a mantra in the book. I have a step-by-step -step exactly how to do it so you can't get lost but everybody forgive forgets two things first you didn't forgive the energy every living thing and even non-living things have energy around them and einstein proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that energy is neither created nor destroyed it just transforms into something else so when you get angry you think your mean words go out into the universe and dissipate and they're gone forever sadly not true 
what they do is those the, that energy, which is emotional, so that emotional anger energy hangs around in your energy field. So for those listening and not seeing what I'm doing, I'm about to hold a, a mug of tea right in front of my face. This mug of tea can symbolize anger and I could hold it off to the side for, for a very long time. But if I don't forgive and I don't move that energy out of my field, now I'm holding the glass in front of my face. I'm missing opportunities. I'm missing my dream significant other. I'm missing new jobs because I'm so focused on the energy. I don't see anything else. So how do you get that energy out of your field? You have to forgive the energy, forgive yourself, forgive the person, place, or thing. Yeah, I said places or thing. The reason people don't want to forgive their, you, you don't have to forgive your number 10 because you don't. A lot of other things you can forgive. Um, let's use a very extreme, horrible example. Let's say you were raped. You don't want to forgive this person. I wouldn't want to forgive this person. Right. It's probably not even appropriate to forgive this person. But there's other things you can forgive. You can forgive the bed, the table, the chair, the park, the building. Right? And mm -hmm. then in the book, I'm going to tell you to create a list of people, places, and things. They just stream it. Write it all down on a piece of paper. Then I want you to put it all on a 10 scale with the ones being the easiest and the tens being the hardest. Start with the number ones. Forget the tens. Start with the ones. And I think you're going to find you're going to feel better. You might as been lose weight. There's a reason to buy my book. You <laughs> might lose weight. You might get some money, but they're going to look at you and they're going to say, Dawn, what are you doing differently? You look different. Is it new hair? I mean, what did you do differently? You look so good. Well, you didn't get any new hair. You didn't do anything differently. You just started to forgive people and it's starting to affect your body language. Right. So do you do this like during meditation? Just when you see that person, you just try and what are you doing? What are you? <laughs> are you... you are alone in your room with nobody around. I have incredible uh, regard for all of the recovery programs out there. And a lot of them that say you have to do what they call an AA, a fourth step, and you have to make amends. And a lot of people want to reach out to these people. Not yours truly. I don't want to reach out to these people. In fact, just because I forgive you doesn't mean I want a relationship with you. It does right. not. It also doesn't mean that you are right. It just means when I go on Facebook, I want to stop looking at your name and feeling something. I want you out of my head. I want to stop thinking about you. That's what it means. Forgiveness is selfish. You do it for you. You don't have to tell anybody you've done it. So you're sitting in the middle of your bed. And what I, I usually imagine that the person is in front of me. And I get it all out. Sometimes I'll even talk to them and then I will forgive them and the energy around them. And there's a mantra in the book you can see, say, and if it does, and then I have people say, I did what you said, Kath, and it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, it did work. Sometimes uh, forgiveness is an onion and you're forgiving the first few layers. And as you forgive those layers, more memories are going to come up. And you'll probably have to take a couple passes. So you're going to get somebody who's a seven and a an eight. And eventually, with enough time, you'll probably get them down to a forgivable level, which is a one, two, or three. So it's this is a marathon. Process. Not a yeah, mm -hmm. it's a process. Do you ever get people that tell you that they can't forgive themselves? That's the hardest person to forgive. Now, this book is a first of three. Um, probably in the next book, one of the chapters will be, what if your number 10 is you? Right. And that's I really far. feel, yeah, I feel like that's what a lot of people struggle with. Like maybe they were angry at the person mm -hmm. they married for whatever reason, you know, there was, right. could be many, but maybe they were mad at themselves for marrying that person or for staying with that person or to having kids with that person, you know, like mad at themselves for not making better choices, the repercussions I think, of. I think people need to forgive themselves for being the person they were to survive. You married that person for very various reasons. You are not that person anymore. We are all like phoenixes and we change and we grow. And then we look back on our lives and we think, oh, well, that was a mistake. Well, no, I forgive the Catherine that was 22 years old who did the best shit she could with the tools that she had at the time. 
Was it good? Probably not. Do I need to forgive myself? We all do. We were, you know, the young and stupid years. But, you know, it's it's a process. So you need to forgive yourself for being that person or forgive yourself for becoming the person you needed to become to survive. Right. And now you need to forgive that, forgive yourself because you have to lose that person because you're now with somebody else. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you forgive, you have to forgive all of that. It's a huge process. Who were you needing to forgive your parents? I my mean, my parents, my parents were both number 10s and it took a very, very long time for me to forgive them. And it was a process and I, I kind of moved through it. I said my mantra and I knew it worked, but it didn't work because every time I thought about them, it would zing and they're both passed away. So can you forgive dead people? Hmm. Yeah, you can very easily because you forgive for you. So it doesn't matter where these people are or are not because you're doing it for you, not for them. They don't care. They're not even thinking about you if they're amongst the living. They don't. They're not They're not giving you a second thought, but you are. You're thinking about it all the time. Did your parents know that you had harbored a bunch of negative? Probably. Probably. Did you have siblings? I do. I do have siblings. I have two. Um, but it's 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 a matter of forgiveness is very, very personal. And it's a journey you you walk by yourself. And it doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. It doesn't matter if somebody's memories are really good about a place and your memories are bad. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter. I forgave all sorts of things. I forgave my, my elementary school building, for example. I forgave the desk that I sat at. I forgave 1974. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> I forgave 1974. Why? She wants to know, would you forgive an actual year? Because it was a crap year. My parents got divorced and I was getting bullied and I tried to commit suicide and a bunch of other things happened. I forgave all the players in that year. But at some point, because I'm a little bit of an overachiever, <laughs> I, I thought I'm just going to forgive the whole damn year. So right. I did. And, you know, I forgave, I'm a cancer survivor, breast cancer survivor. So I forgave the chemo. I forgave the cancer. I forgave the doctor. I forgave the chemo chair. I forgave the radiation. I forgave myself for getting cancer. I forgave all of that. So you don't just forgive people. You can forgive people, places, and things. Anything goes. Anything is forgivable. But do start with the number ones because the eights, nines, and tens, they're a bear. They, some of those tents, they might be, you know, somebody's rapist or somebody's abuser. Um, and just from, and I can speak on Dawn's behalf for this one. If you, if anybody listening is living with a number 10, might I suggest that you might want to consider getting out? Right. You know, if yeah. they're abusing you in any way, shape or form, you might want to consider getting other living arrangements. Right. But do start with your number ones and eventually some beautiful people can, can, you know, somebody, you know, you see these people on television who can forgive their child's murderer and stuff like that. Right. I wrote the book on forgiveness and I'm not even sure I could do that. There are very beautiful people out there. Um, but if you can't, there's other things you can forgive the courtroom, the chair yourself. You, there's other things you can forgive that will move the dial just enough that you can get it out of your head and go on with your life. But do start with the ones, twos, and threes, please. Right. That seems like uh, more approachable that way. You know, like paying off debt, you start yeah. off with your your smaller balances smaller and get bills. those until you get up to the more overwhelming thing. Well, and who are the ones? They're the person who cut you, who in aisle four of the grocery store just cuts you off. You can forgive that person. The person at work who continually says, you know, steals your lunch. Okay, they might be a four or a five. Come on, you can forgive these people. You know, the person yeah. in, in high school who tripped you in the hallway. Okay, you can forgive that person. They're the easy ones. The, they're the little things that you can forgive. Everybody has them. You know, and the energy is serious. You know, um, I had a number one. I went to school with this person. And I thought about it and I thought, you know, it was so many years ago. We were in, you know, high school. I can forgive this woman. Couldn't even remember what we were mad at, to be quite honest. Hadn't talked to this person in 30 plus years. Not a word. So I sat down in the middle of my bed 
and I said my little mantra and I put my hand in my heart whenever I forgive because it's to remind myself to speak from your heart because it's the feeling behind the words that's the magic. It's really the words are just for us humans. It it has the really it's the feeling behind it that's that's where the push is. And I forgave her. True story. Two hours later, she calls me up on the telephone. Yeah, yeah. I was amazed as you were. And so I I as my jaw dropped to my feet. So I picked my <laughs> jaw up and I put it back on my face and I and I spoke to her for a while. And you know, we were it was like we were back in high school. We forgave each other. We, you know, got it through but i'm a very curious little bear and i said you know i just have to know after all these years why did you for why did you choose today to call me she said you know it was the damnedest thing a figurine you gave me back in school flew off my shelf and landed in the middle of my floor and i saw it and thought maybe i should forgive you and two hours early was when i was saying my forgiveness mantra oh and might i have 700 miles apart Wow. So if forgiveness has the power to do that to a number one person, imagine what it's going to do to the higher numbers. And for you naysayers out there, the book does have a whole science chapter that I that I have found with studies to back up what I'm saying. Unbelievable. So when you when you know you need to forgive someone, where do you feel it? Do you feel mm -hmm. it in your heart? Does your heart feel heavy? Is that where that energy is? Like the black ball of <laughs> toxicity that you want to get out? Is that where you feel it? Or do you feel it in your gut? Or... Everybody's different. Everybody's no, different. I know. I'm asking I you. <laughs> I feel it kind of right here in my, in my solar plexus. And I kind of feel it there. Some people feel lighter in some of the heavier ones. I kind of felt like I was free. My shoulders felt lighter, if you will. And it was a very strange feeling, but it did. And I felt a, a kind of a malaise leave me, like I'm kind of happy. Um, everybody's different. My older son gets tired, like really tired. And he knows he's forgiven people because he gets really tired. Mm. And Your a lot of people relaxed. get tired. Because, so I advise everybody to do this before you go to bed because your body heals itself when it's sleeping. Mm -hmm. And when you forgive, all, you know, everybody says anger is toxic, but nobody tells you exactly why. Okay, I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> anger is toxic because the, the, the anger actually gets into the cells of your body. And when you forgive, all that has to come out somehow. Your body heals itself when you're sleeping. So we hope that it kind of magically... He, my body will heal itself in the middle of the night. But those of you that are kind of like me, um, I really am an overachiever. So when I sat down to do this and I figured all this out, I wrote my list and there had to be 50 people, places and things on there. I forgave everybody all at once. I was there for two hours. I forgave everybody because I thought, let's just do this. <laughs> and you then sleep I spent, for a week. <laughs> I spent the next three days in bed with what everybody thought was a stomach flu. My oh. body needed to take three days to literally, as polite as I can, clear itself out. I slept for three days and it just, it was like I had the flu. I didn't have the flu. I just forgave too many people at once. So yeah. in the book and personally, let me add, tell you, please don't forgive more than 10 to 12 people at a time and start with your number ones hmm. and do them kind of in, in batches. And then the sad thing is you're going to get through your list. You might get your number 10 down to a six, which is awesome. Then you're going to think I'm done, right? No, you're going to probably want to create a new list. This is kind of a <laughs> lifelong thing because we're human <laughs> beings and human beings irritate other human beings. Mm -hmm. We all have family, blood family, and blood family irritates blood family. There's, right. there's really nothing you can do. So sadly, there's always somebody you can forgive. Yeah. So I usually do it at night before I go to bed. Um, you said something interesting. You said somebody that was a 10 and they moved to a six. Yep. You so can down slowly. your process is to get them to go Work down the scale, not a 10 and gone. 10, no. move your no. way down. the. Okay. Number 10 is so awful. It is an unforgivable act, whatever that means to you. It could be your parents. It could be a blood relative. Mm -hmm. It could be somebody that hurt you. It could be anything. Your number 10 is unique to you. And it's an unforgivable act. Do you need to forgive the unforgivable? No, you don't. 
because there are other things you can forgive. And as you forgive the other things and you, and maybe it's your parents, maybe it's your mother, you can, maybe you can forgive other things and then you go back and then maybe a week later, you're like, okay, well, you've kind of gotten rid of the first layer or two. Well, maybe you can get the 10 down to a 9.75, mm-hmm. you know, right. you're going to slowly move them down. And as you forgive those layers, it'll get easier and easier. So eventually you might, you might be able to get that 10 down to a two or three and you can usually kick those to the curb. It takes mental gymnastics to do to work with the number 10. You really have to look at things from a different perspective. They're really hard, which yeah. is why I always advise don't forgive the person, forgive the other things around it, forgive yourself, forgive the building. There's forgive the other things because tens, tens are a bear. They're hard. Yeah. Yeah. When you have that person in front of you in your mind, are they talking? Or are they just sitting there? It's your Listening. party. You can do whatever you want. In my <laughs> world, they're not saying anything. I've heard about as much as I want from these people. <laughs> They've got duct tape on their mouth. Yeah, man. I've got them in a chair with duct tape, man. And if they're not saying anything, this is my turn to say whatever I want. Right. It's, it's, it's a movie you're playing in your head and you can play it any way you want. Yeah. Get it out. People say, write it down, write them a letter. Okay, I've done that. It didn't help. They say, well, burn the letter. Okay, don't burn your house down. But I did that too. They were still a 10. Didn't yeah. help. Yeah. Because they were family. So they were still a 10, you know, that kind of thing. So this is the only thing I have found that gets them out of your head. Right. Completely. Yeah, and the mind it's, is it's, powerful. And you look at these people and you know you've forgiven when you can look at their name and you don't have good feelings. You don't have bad feelings. It's completely neutral. That's Mm. how, you know, you've done, you don't feel, you don't feel anything to be, to be honest. And now, you know, you're done. If you can look at that person in your head and forgive them and say, go in peace. And you can really mean go in peace and not go in lava. Hope you get stuck. (laughs) (laughs) If you could actually say go in peace, then, you know, you forgive them. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So are you in remission? <laughs> yeah, I am. Uh, I got breast cancer, stage three, triple positive breast cancer in 2012. And I am cancer free. I awesome. went through the whole thing. I wrote a book about it because of course I did. But you know, I did the chemo. I had dozens of operations. I had radiation. Mm. I had you name it. I had it. But but I am completely 100% cancer free today. Oh, that's amazing. Congratulations. I'm happy for Thank you. Thank you. Um, I intend to stay that way. Thank you very much. Yes, exactly. So did you always want to be a writer or did all of these topics that you're passionate about just throw you into it? Writing was how I got through school very early on. I discovered I was, I could, I was pretty good at stringing words together so my essays always pulled me out of the drink. And if the and if the test didn't have an essay, I was kind of in trouble. So <laughs> I knew I knew I was I like to write and I've been doing it for years and years. Yeah. It's my happy place. Why, you know, if, if something happens, I'm like the world's guinea pig. So if something happens to me, eventually I'll write a blog or I'll write a book about it. I love it though, because somebody out there needs to hear it or read it. That's just the way it is. You're never alone. Um, So I wrote down the the little bird on your shoulder. What's that one? What's that about? The little bird on your shoulder is a book I wrote to teach you how to tap into your intuition. And it teaches you how to have a two-way conversation with your intuition. Everybody hears their intuition. There's no special people out there. Sorry, but there's not. Everybody on the planet does this. So you either hear it, feel it, know it, or you just sense it. A Mm -hmm. lot of people walk into a room and it just feels off. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can't really pin it and you, and you kind of dismiss it because it just feels wrong. Okay. Walk out when you feel that way, because that's a little bird in your shoulder issuing a warning. Maybe the little driving down the road and all of a sudden you hear in your head, you should turn right. sounds like your own voice, but you always turn left to go home. But you have this real feeling that you should go right. Well, go right because you probably avoided a traffic accident or something. So the book is designed to teach you how to tap into that, to that intuition to help you with your life. 
Great. I love that whole topic of intuition. So um, I'm just wondering which books I'm going to get next. <laughs> okay, I'm shopping right now. Uh, Rainbows and Banana Peels. That's about my cancer journey. I, I actually wrote that book um, right after I got over cancer because back when I had it, um, you, they sent you, this is true, it's awful. They, I don't think they do it anymore. But back in the day, they sent you to chemo class. Yeah, chemo class. And they sit you in this horrible little room and proceed to tell you all the bad side effects and bad things are about to happen to you. And my brain snapped because they didn't tell me anything about the positive things, what the good things I should be eating, nutrition, who you, what you should be doing, nothing. So I looked at Nurse Ratchet at the front of the room and I said, I'm not going to get all of those things. And she looked at me. I live in the South. She said, oh, honey, you're going to get most of them. And I said, no, I'm not. Fast forward one year, I didn't get as sick as everybody else. I had really bad chemo. I lost my hair. I was sick as a dog, but I didn't get the infections that everybody else did. And she came up to me one day and she said, what, what are you eating? And I looked at her and I said, excuse me. She said, you're doing something. What are you doing? And I just smiled at her. And I said, remember when I told you I wasn't going to get sick as everybody else? It's all about your perspective. I can't control what the world throws at me, but I can sure control how I get through it. So, you know, I, I don't that. like to let the little cancer terrorist win. So that's kind of how I got through cancer. And I wrote a book about it. Yeah. The mind over matter. I always wonder mm -hmm. that too, just in the back of my mind, when people get that diagnosis, if it is just an automatic death sentence to people where they just, that's it. That's my, Everybody's that's what it's going to be. 10 out of 10 people, they hear that C word and they think it's an automatic death sentence. Right. Everybody, including me, everybody right. who hears you've got cancer. I don't care if it's stage zero, one, two, three, or four, everybody's brain goes there. And what I learned, it is, is not a death sentence. I know many people who have survived stage four cancer and are still alive to this day. So it is not a death sentence. And I learned to trust that little bird on my shoulder, which I wrote after Rainbows and Banana Peels, because it could see farther and it showed me what to eat. And it led me down the path of where, where it was probably best for me. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so inspirational, too, because people need to hear that kind of stuff. Whenever you hear that somebody had stage three, stage four, it's like, mm -hmm. are they still are they still here? Are they still here? Yeah, yeah, I know. I love it. It's so not a death gonna... sentence. And no. it, you know, don't die until you're dead, people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, don't die until you're dead. If you know, if it's my last breath, okay, maybe I'll die now because I'm about to. But until that last day, there's life. There's there's hope. There's promise. Yeah. There's probably a cure out there someplace. Don't die until you're dead. Oh, I love that. So are you in the middle of a book right now that you're going to writing? I'm always in the middle of a book. Um, <laughs> but this, the, this, uh, the forgiveness is a series of three books. So I'm actually writing book two as we speak. Okay. So hopefully what, that'll be out in a little while. What's the theme of it? Can you say? I want to concentrate on exactly how to forgive your number tens if you're stuck and how to forgive yourself, which I think is in, I think if you're your own number 10, I think um, that's really hard. And I want to also talk about how to forgive cancer. Oh, that's wonderful. So many people yeah. unfortunately need that. I buried my wig in the backyard. We call her Raquel. And one day I decided Raquel. Oh my God. That was my Raquel. name in Spanish class. <laughs> And I had her in my closet and I thought, you know, I thought it was a symbol of not getting cancer again. And then I thought, well, maybe this is a symbol that it could come back and I'm scared to get rid of Raquel, which you don't want to have that. So I buried her in my backyard and we, we, we sold our house last year. So now I'm thinking, well, if they ever dig her up, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to see this hair. <laughs> they're going to say, where's the body? They're going to keep, I mean, I, I actually got a little worried about it, but you know, oh, at least, my yeah, God, that's hilarious. Raquel got left behind. She's buried. It's somewhere in Wake Forest. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. 
So Death do you of Raquel. only write, I don't want to say only write books because to me, that is like the, the biggest thing ever, but do you write blogs? Do you? I do. I have, if you go to katherinegiovanni.com and Catherine is spelled very strangely. Thanks mom. K-A-T-H-A-R-I-N-E Giovanni.com. And I have a blog. I have blogs in there and articles and that sort of thing. Yeah. I love how you word things. So you should think about having a podcast too. I think you'd be <laughs> great at that just to have your little, little bits of information. Keep, keep you go. people going. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good idea. Well, it was so nice to meet you. Is there anything else you need to promote before we say goodbye? Your book? No, go. Those, if people want to know which books to read first, and I do have some business books in there. I used to teach people how to be a concierge for 20 years, and I retired in 2023. But I suggest you read the forgiveness book first, and then if you want to circle back and learn about intuition, then buy the Little Bird book. But for those of you that don't like to read, I do have the audio book available on Amazon. Okay. I'm glad you said that word, con concierge. I never know how to say that. Concierge. Concierge. And you, th those people are the people that are responsible for telling you where you can go in the neighborhood and stuff mm -hmm. when you stay at a hotel, where are they good? Right. So what you were in that business and then you formed, what did you do? You formed your own like group for, for these people, right? I did. I'm credited with being the founder of the independent concierge industry. And in 1998, we were meeting in event planners and I read this article in Entrepreneur Magazine because we really didn't have computers back then. We had floppy disks and dial-up modems and I could get a sandwich and a cup of coffee in the time it took to upload something. That's how awful <laughs> That's it <true>. was. <laughs> but I, uh, I read an article about this young you know, industry called the concierge industry. And what they did is they took the hotel concierge and brought it to mainstream America, which I thought was really interesting. So we decided to re repurpose our company and we turned ourselves into a concierge company and moved down to North Carolina uh, from New Jersey. And if there were 20 concierge companies in the world, that might've been high. So the, about six months later, I had a website up and everything and people started to call me because there was no books. There was no, there was nothing. So they called me up saying, could you help me figure out what to charge? And I did. And my husband came into my office and asked that million dollar question. Why are you doing it for free? <laughs> really good question. So we flipped our business a third time, not that I'm counting. And we turned ourselves into consultants. Eventually I was told there's no association for independent concierge. And because I seem to have a high tolerance to pain, <laughs> I created a concierge association, ran that for 20 years. So I retired last year from all of it. Did you write a book about any of your experiences? I did. Concierge? It's the concierge manual. And I just uh, last year published the final edition, which was the sixth edition. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That, that, would be that an book is read the, too. I wrote that book every year for 20 years. <laughs> I love it. I love it. There's so much to read. I'm so excited. <laughs> well, if you want to start a concierge business, that's probably a good book to read, to read. And I wrote a customer service book. That's probably out of print at this point. But um, if you want to take your customer service to concierge level, five-star service, I can do it in 30 seconds. Instead of saying you're welcome, switch it out to, it was my pleasure. Oh, that's all you have to do. That's wow. all you have to do. There's a story. I know we have to go, but there's a really no, quick we story. Don't. Go ahead. <laughs> when I was uh, when I was uh, getting chemotherapy, I had this red kind of chemo that's supposed to hurt your heart. It did not hurt my heart, but it could have. So I had to go to the heart center. So the first time I went to the heart center to get my whatever test they wanted to put on me. Yeah. Um, we went in to register and this woman was robotic. She didn't look up. She didn't smile. She kind of was dressed very casual and it all seemed bad. So because I am who I am, I cracked a joke because I wanted to see if I could get in, crack her armor just a little yeah. bit. And she smiled at me. So I got in and within five minutes, I had her smiling and I told her, all you have to do is smile at people and say, it was my pleasure. I, sp I promise that's all I did. Fast forward six months, because I had to go twice a year and we're sitting, my husband and I uh, are sitting in the, you know, in the waiting room and she comes flying out of her office saying, Miss Giovanni, Miss Giovanni, I really want to check you in. 
okay, I don't care who checks me in. So we walk into her office. This is a changed woman. She is smiling. She is animated. She's dressed professionally. She shakes our hand when I come in. She leads us to a chair. I mean, it's a completely changed woman. And she said, I did what you said. And I got the attention of my supervisor. And now I'm running the department. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Now I'm sure she did other things as well as that to get to be the lead and that the manager of that department. But saying it was my pleasure makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that. That was a great story. <laughs> it was such a pleasure to meet you, Catherine. I'm so oh, happy. Oh, it's my pleasure. See yeah. how that works? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was so great to, I mean, you really did inspire all, in so many different ways. So I thank you so much for taking the time to be on my show. I really appreciate uh, it. It's a genuine pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, take care. We'll talk soon. Thank you. You too. All right. Bye-bye.